Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for that, John. Thanks, um, uh, Nelson. Actually, my last uh, st last week I was at London Bridge. Um, talking about stations and transformations. I don't know if any of you are working on, on that, but it is the most I extraordinary transformation, everything that's going on with Thameslink. Um, I actually asked to go and see it because I'm, I'm always going to see Crossrail and using that as an example of things that are going on. Uh, but uh, the, um, the engineering feat at London Bridge to essentially rebuild it and to keep that moving operationally uh, I can't imagine that there are many other uh, countries in the world who would uh, A, be able to do that, and B, be so concerned about the customer experience that we'd keep the station open while we're trying to do it. It's, it I was uh, extraordinarily impressed by what, what's going on there. Um, actually, yesterday I opened a conference uh, with the Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister talking about uh, rebuilding an economy and the importance of infrastructure. And uh, it, it was uh, actually the parallels, uh, even with an economy that starts off uh, with the challenges they have and the things we're trying to do, uh, are, strangely, uh, are strangely equivalent. But um, that's just my own uh, reflection. Look, as John said, I, you know, I, I come at the, uh, the question of infrastructure very much from a private sector perspective. You know, I had 27 years as a banker, seven years doing the Olympic Games. I've just been in government, um, what, 17 months. So uh, when I think about getting something done, all my instincts uh, are really, uh, you know, in, in that proportion of, uh, of, my own, uh, of my own experience. Uh, I mean, the Chancellor asked me to come into government really because uh, he wanted to make sure government could be as proactive as it possibly could be in getting our infrastructure built. It was as, as simple as that. Um, you know, some of the things we had in the Olympics were perhaps unique to the Olympics, the sort of inspirational nature of the, um, uh, the product we had, the global stage we were operating on and the whole world looking at you. Um, the immovable deadline, I think, is something I've tried to, to recreate. You know, having uh, Her Majesty the Queen parachuting into your main stadium at, um, and you knew it was going to happen at 20 to 9 on the 27th of July 2012 was a good way to focus you on being ready on time. And I've tried to recreate that in some of our other uh, projects. Uh, but there are a lot of things that are transferable in terms of, uh, in terms of project management, whether it's our use of um, specialist bodies, uh, really just making sure you've hired the best possible people, um, and really just a relentless focus on making sure you meet uh, delivery targets and budget targets. Um, you know, at the Olympic Games, the negotiating position was always, do you want to be the person who's responsible for us not being ready on time? Uh, and frankly, uh, you know, we're trying to use more and more of that kind of sense of accountability for ensuring we make the decisions that are necessary to, uh, to keep us on time and to get these important projects uh, ready. I think the other thing that's uh, that's really important is an absolute clarity on what it is we're trying to accomplish. You know, sometimes you can be confused by a multiplicity of objectives, uh, which can sort of gives you the excuse to you know not to just focus on one and get it done. So really helping people understand what we're trying to do, when we're trying to do it, and how we're going to get it done um, sounds obvious, but actually bringing that clarity to the table is very important. Um, the comments this morning, I really want to talk about how government can play its role effectively in getting um, really a combination of things, the right long-term infrastructure plan, but then also delivery against that plan in a consistent way. Um, the, uh, and something I don't often talk about, which, um, it, which I think is absolutely critical in terms of facilitating everything else, is to make sure, of course, that the public finances are in good shape. Um, a lot of the things I'm dealing with today are simply because, you know, the UK economy, uh, certainly its financial markets, uh, pretty much crashed uh, at the end of uh, 2007, 2008. So, um, you know, this government came into power in 2010 with one clear and overriding objective, which was to stabilise the public finances. So spending to all intents and purposes stopped. Uh, on uh, capital projects and to all intents and purposes the private market seized up too 
And frankly, before you can do many of the things we want to do, uh, you've got to demonstrate to yourself and to the public that you've got control of those public finances. So when I actually stand back and really think about the things that are making a difference, um, uh, getting the deficit under control, convincing the markets that the UK is a good credit, um, creating the room to be able to contribute a bigger proportion of uh, government spending uh, to public infrastructure and to be able to do that on a consistent and long-term basis is an absolutely critical part of getting this right. And of course, that same stable economic environment is what creates um, uh, the ability of the private sector, both uh, industry and the financial markets, to do the same in those sectors where we rely um, in the main on the private sector. So getting the economy in a stable state is absolutely, you know, is an absolutely critical precondition for all the other things uh, that we uh, we want to do. You know, and we're at a relative sweet spot in that now. Clearly, inflation is below the target rate. The deficit's uh, coming down now from a third to a half. Remember, though, that's the extent to which we add to borrowing every year. So we have to get to zero and positive before we bring down the overall level of debt. I'm not sure that's always as clear to people at large as it should be. Um, and the economy is now growing at something around 3%, which makes us the top performer in the G7. So the macroeconomic position is stable. Uh, the responsibility now for the government is really to focus on what can sustain that for as long as possible, what can make that growth as high quality as possible, how can we improve the relative trade balance, improve exports, particularly focusing on the growth markets, how can we ensure that the growth is not totally focused on consumption, but on investment as well? You know, all those things. And I think in the, our medium-term recovery will depend on how well-balanced uh, the economy is as it goes forward. Uh, and of course, that's where infrastructure uh, fits in. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at every opportunity, um, I mean, N Nelson made the case that um, you know, I think we're making good progress in the fight to get the broader buy-in to how important infrastructure is, why we need to focus on it, the impact it makes on the economy. But I think every opportunity I've got, uh, I try uh, and make um, the case. Um, it's, and I really do it by focusing on the two objectives. Number one, the right infrastructure, whether it's transport infrastructure, the right energy systems, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the right water systems, uh, the right communication systems are at the heart of what will improve our long-term rate of economic growth. It's how you keep it at 3% or 3.5% and how it, it's how you make it last longer. So getting that right uh, is absolutely critical and it's a long-term game. You know, you hear the Prime Minister and the Chancellor talk about the long-term economic plan uh, you know, that's obviously uh, at, the, you know, at the heart of what the government's trying to do. It'll clearly also be at the heart of the uh, conservative economic or political strategy for the elections. But um, there's no part of what we're doing that is more consistent with a long-term approach to the plan than the consistent addressing of all the things you need to do around developing and delivering our infrastructure. Um, the, uh, the other huge economic advantage, of course, of uh, getting your infrastructure plan right and being consistent in its delivery is the enormous impact it makes on um, jobs and growth. You know, these projects, as you all know, you're involved in them, are big employers of people uh, and make a very, very, uh, a very, significant, uh, a very significant difference. So, uh, given all that, the case for infrastructure, I don't... It shouldn't be politically contentious. You know, every um, political party, I think, buys in to the power of getting your infrastructure built right from an economic point of view. All the arguments, and frankly, they're pretty mild arguments, are all about how quickly and how well it's happening. So inevitably, the, the government in power has to justify what's happening, and the opposition will complain that it's not really happening fast or well enough. But that's quite a healthy debate, actually, because it simply keeps you focused on making sure uh, we're effective. I mean, it, it's actually a little bit of a false um, political debate, because frankly, the pressure is for me to spend all my time taking credit for projects I had nothing to do with, because they're all the ones that are most evident, 
like a crossrail coming out of the ground, and all the real work we're doing uh, to, uh, you know, in, in terms of political effort now is mostly about projects, and you'll, you know, I see Alison's here, so you'll be hearing about HS2 later, are all about projects that will be coming out of the ground later, and my successors will be taking the credit for cutting the ribbon on those. So the, the political debate, uh, frankly, often, often misses the point for that reason. Um, I, I, you know, I always refer to the, you know, if you think what I've said so far, the importance of getting the public finances right in the broader economic strategy, really selling the case for infrastructure so everybody buys into its prioritization. And then generally speaking, I think in terms of four layers of um, interventions the government needs to make and that our, our strategy really from an, in, an infrastructure point of view is to perform in these four areas better and better and better and more and more consistently to make sure the environment's right and our project is right within those four areas. And those four areas for me are number one, the government owns the plan, Number two, the government's got to make sure the money's there, whether it's providing it directly or creating an environment in which it can be raised. Number three is we ultimately own the planning regime. Uh, and number four is we need to make sure within the government and the public sector that our own capability to the extent where the client or running projects is as sharp and as focused and as delivery oriented as we can make it. And so when I, you know, so when I think about what the government needs to do, I'm always focused on improving our performance in each of those four areas because wherever I come across problems, delays, concerns, they always fall into one of those four buckets. So um, we're always looking to solve specific problems in each of those areas and to push forward our policy agenda in each of those areas so we have um, environments or policies in those areas which are working effectively in the medium to long term. So that's, you know, that's how I think about it in my, um, in my own head. I mean, so let's talk a little bit about the plan, first of all. Um, thank you to ACE and, of course, to NIPSEF for their contribution to the National I uh, Infrastructure Plan. The first iteration was produced in 2010. It was a, a bit more of a collection of the things that were going on. As each iteration has developed, we've tried to turn it uh, much more into a program with a sense of delivery about it, with a sense of priority about it, with a sense of uh, here's where we are and here's what we need to do to make sure this is actually delivered. And I hope uh, those of you who um, are the audience for that can see the progression. I also invite you to tell us what further progression you would like, either to help you in your you know, whether you're, uh, whether you're building things, designing things, or financing things, what other information needs to be in there, what other work we need to do to make that a very uh, practical plan and program which we can share and use to deliver uh, really on behalf of, uh, on behalf of the country. Um, I think the interesting, and so that getting, you know, continuing to iterate that plan is absolutely vital. And I think the discipline of doing it year in, year out, and making it better has been a powerful one. And so we will stick to that. And you know, as part of that process, it's frankly f uh, forcing the key departments to be much clearer about their strategies in each respective area. So for example, in the next iteration, I would expect us to have a much clearer articulation of the plan around what I would describe as our science infrastructure which for me, you know, is, which isn't always a, um, uh, a sector that uh, is associated with the core economic um, infrastructure sectors, you know, the more common ones of water, transport, communications, and energy. But given the competitive, the potential competitive advantage of the UK economy is an absolutely crucial one for us. You know, I'd also see the National Infrastructure Plan is the perfect place for us to articulate the next phase of our communication strategy. You know, how do you get everybody linked up? Uh, I mean, how do you get fiber laid around the country? And what would a 100% target look like? How do you get the fiber from the cabinet to the home if that's your ultimate goal, which is to get people truly, um, you know, truly online? 
So those are the kinds of things that over the years I would expect to be really effectively addressed uh, in the National Infrastructure Plan as well as the traditional areas where I think we have articulated clear strategies in, in transport and energy. Um, and I would also expect us to begin to look at some of the harder problems like addressing the synergies across the sectors. So, you know, how do you plan uh, not simply in uh, the silo of transport, but or simply in the, and John, I'm sure I'll talk about, you could talk about this later, you're probably going to have to now I've said this. Uh, you know, how do you make sure your row strategy uh, is properly coordinated with your port strategy? And how do you make sure when you're building those things, you also uh, understand uh, what you might do with the road when it's dug up uh, for uh, for other potential infrastructure uses, and how do you how do you plan in long term resilience? Uh, all issues which this audience is superbly well addressed to support us on. Let me speak for a, a little bit about the the money. When I first got this job, everybody thought, or you know, the, there was a sort of commonly accepted um, view that the the principal constraint on delivering infrastructure faster was money. Um, and it's, it, that's it's strangely not, not really true in many respects. We are much shorter uh, oven-baked investable projects than we are the capital that's needed to finance them. Um, you know, there is a, I have a very long list of people, long sort of a queue of people outside my office who, you know, from all over the world who say, please, 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 um, you know, tell us what's in the pipeline because there is no asset we would rather own than an asset in the UK, one that's infrastructure and one that essentially will throw off for us uh, long term inflation adjusted returns. I mean, that is uh, absolute magic from the financial markets point of view. So our job is actually to churn these out uh, a little faster because the money uh, is absolutely there for those kinds of projects which have revenue generating capability. The, and the great strength, frankly, of the UK, if you look back over the decades, has been our ability to introduce private capital to finance our public infrastructure. There really isn't a country in the world which has moved faster or more creatively to do that, whether it's... You know, if you think back to the privatizations where we were the first uh, country really to put our electricity industry, our telecoms industry into private ownership, um, uh, we were really the country that introduced the whole concept of uh, public-private partnerships. And you know, frankly, you know, in the Treasury, we spend a lot of time working with countries around the world, showing them what we've done over previous decades as they try and, uh, and look at uh, the future. I mean, uh, next month, I'm being visited by a U.S. congressional committee, who, um, you know, having appreciated that their infrastructure, you know, seriously needs renewal, are looking at PPPs as a way of doing that. You know, and normally one associates the U.S. Uh, in the vanguard of financial market developments. In here, in this case, they're absolutely looking at us. So we. Uh, you know, should be proud of and continue to um, take advantage of the create creativity we have in how we get uh, our infrastructure financed. And you have to take it sector by sector. Uh, in simple terms, I refer to stabilizing the financial markets. I actually think the certainly one of the most important things we've done since I've been in this job was in the spending round in June 2013 when we laid out the uh, capital program for really through to 2020-21 uh, for uh, those sectors who are financed directly uh, by taxpayers' money, which is essentially, I mean, uh, the vast majority of, of, of that goes into transport. Uh, and I assume, John, you're going to talk about the Highways Agency, but of all the, you know, the changes underway, um, saying to the Highways Agency, here's five, six years' worth of um, money, you can now organise yourself and you can organise your suppliers around the certainty of a programme of delivery, is, I mean, you, this again, this is your business as engineers, is absolutely transformational. It would have, you know, the, the question I think we'll all be asking ourselves shortly is, well, why didn't we do that earlier? This seems like a much better way, uh, not to run a railway, not, not to run a railroad, but to run a... Uh, um, a, a road building company um, and we get 
So that's very important to have sorted out. And you know, we have a utility sector which is the envy of the world. I mean, the easiest way we finance our infrastructure is you know, in the water sector, in the main in the, in the energy sector, where we have strong corporate entities operating uh, within an industry where pricing is governed by an independent regulator and where the cash flow from the existing business, is true of um, the airports as well, uh, is sufficient to support the capital expenditure program going forward and the capital markets and the banking markets are prepared to finance those entities on that basis. That is a very sweet long-term way of getting your infrastructure built and we should be extremely careful in protecting the integrity of those independent regulators and ensuring they continue to get the balance right of um, making sure that the markets they regulate uh, operate certainly in, in the interests of consumers and are affordable, but also, of course, generate sufficient returns to allow the continuing renewal of our uh, capital uh, program, but also uh, new investment. And that really is a precious thing which consistently good behaviour has given us over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. But it's one of those things that can get lost in a heartbeat if, uh, if, uh, if, we, uh, if we don't continue to operate with that kind of integrity. So that's very important. Policy changes, of course, and I think a key, I, you know, when I talk about getting the money and policy, which tend to come together, uh, you have to think about the energy industry. You know, we are in a process of extreme transformation into a new energy market uh, regime. The legislation has been passed. You know, the economists have done their work in terms of structuring it, but now it's um, translating itself into practice. And um, you know, serious uh, energy companies and serious investors have to make the decision that they're prepared to participate in those markets on the basis that we've laid out the policy. So, you know, you've seen uh, the beginnings of our new nuclear policy with the deal we've done with uh, EDF at, uh, at Hinkley Point. Uh, a few, uh, probably about a month ago now, we um, issued the first set of new contracts for some big renewable projects. At the end of this year, we'll have the first um, uh, capacity auction market, or capacity auction, um, in the, uh, you know, which will really be the framework within which investment in the uh, gas-powered uh, electricity market will be determined. So that's hugely important in terms of the scale of investment we're making in energy. It's going through a period of transformation. Uh, it's actually um, going well in terms of keeping absolutely to the timetable and I think we'll look back in five years' time and find ourselves with a new regime uh, that, uh, that is working effectively, but it's something we have to manage and look at very carefully. Um, you know, the third area that uh, government needs to get right, and I'm not, I, I, you know, we can spend as little or as much uh, time on this as you, uh, as, you find, uh, as you find interesting, is really uh, all about the uh, planning regime. I mean, I have one very simple message. Uh, maybe the, most, the simplest message is I'm, I'm not trying to get planning results to be any different than uh, our current processes determined. So I don't want more yeses or more noes. I simply want to get to yes or no as fast as possible in a streamlined way because the process of getting to those yeses or noes uh, can be, uh, actually for some of you, it may actually be, you know, ad and advising on that, it may actually be quite a lucrative process, but we, it, it, it's also, uh, you know, if you look at um, uh, global, global economic comparisons, it's the bit in the infrastructure cycle where we're least competitive because we spend too much money and time on that and we've got to get, get better. You know, the great thing for me about the Olympic Games was everybody accepted we only had seven years and therefore we uh, concentrated the planning powers uh, in East London into one body. And uh, you know, we, got it, we got done in seven years, what I fear would have taken 30 years through the normal cycle. And as far as I could tell, you know, no rare species were irretrievably lost, you know, despite you know, many arguments with feral cats on the way. So it is, it is possible, and everything we're doing 
uh, really is about looking at where the system doesn't quite work, how we can streamline it. And I, again, a lot of you are participants in it. My sense is that, you know, broadly speaking, we're happy with, um, if you like, the, the regime. We don't want to completely change it, and we just need to keep streamlining it, working with it, taking out some of the pinch points, rationalizing bits of it. But, but I, I think we're doing the right work there. And the final area uh, where I think we um, uh, you know, need to be extremely focused on our work is, is in terms of government's own capability. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's an interesting area. It was the first thing the Prime Minister asked me to do was actually to review the commercial capability in those government departments that are responsible for um, delivering infrastructure. Um, and it's... Uh, you know, and there are some, I think, very obvious things, which are, are largely how we go about doing business now already. So in the main, you know, where we're working on big infrastructure projects or where we have a consistent program of infrastructure projects, you know, we either set up a special purpose entity uh, or we have an existing agency uh, which is focused on delivery in those areas. And so m most of what I think we, we need to do now is to ensure that in those areas we're operating in exactly the right way, that we're able to attract the very best people we can to lead those areas. And I've been very focused in starting at the top on the very simple principle that if you've got a you know, terrific chairman, a terrific chief executive, strangely enough, it means that everybody at, the, at each succeeding level below tend to be of a much higher caliber. So getting those key appointments right, uh, I think is absolutely, uh, is absolutely critical and that's certainly how we've been going about it. Um, ensuring the incentives are right. I mean, there's a sort of a lot of discussion about, you know, um, the, the simplistic way of looking at it is that civil servants are very good at policy and there's some sort of magical private sector skill which is to do with being commercial or delivery. And that there's an element, I think, there's a, I think that's an important way of thinking about things. People who historically have succeeded in the civil service and risen to the top levels have been people who have demonstrated uh, policy skill, not necessarily those who've delivered big projects. But I'm, I'm not sure that that, 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 isn't, you know, that isn't at the beginning of changing. Uh, the, I mean, the problem really is, I don't think is, you know, there's a, frankly, the civil servant is, the civil, the civil service is full of really smart, hardworking, really good people. The, the problem is the environment often that we put them in uh, and the politicization of things that ought to be straightforward delivery projects. So, um, you know, for me, it's mostly about ensuring the environment these people are working in to go back to some of my opening uh, comments, is absolutely crystal clear about what it is we want them to accomplish and that we give them the resources in terms of people and money and time to get it done in the most effective way. Then things tend to work out uh, exactly as you, would have, uh, as you would have liked them to. So, those are the you know, so that capability uh, at a number of levels in government is, a, is something we continue to work away at. And I'm, I think, you know, very confident that bit by bit, because um, everybody is focused on getting to the same result, uh, you know, we will uh, we will get to the right uh, we will get to the right outcomes. So, um, you know, where where do I th you know what do I think the challenges are ahead? If you like, take you know that's what I that's what we're trying to work on. What what, what do I think the the particular challenges are or what do we want to see over, over, the, over the years ahead. Um, I think the sort of the fundamental balance to be able to demonstrate, because we need to show the public we're succeeding, is that we have a plan, right, the long-term plan, and that it, you know, that does lay out what we need to build and what outcomes we can expect uh, from uh, delivering those projects and that it reflects an underlying strategy in each of these areas that makes enormous sense. And that we're, you know, these are long, we should be really be able to be consistent about that and articulate about it. Um, but I think at the same time, given the short-term um, requirement of sort of the, the market, both the sort of the public market as, as well as the, uh, the financial markets and the stock markets, we need to be able to demonstrate that against that plan, 
stuff is happening all the time. Projects are starting, projects are being developed very well, projects are finishing, and we're celebrating great outcomes. And I think we're now moving into a phase where we're going to find that uh, much, much easier because, if you like, we've got the um, hiatus that was essentially created by the crash behind us and we're moving back into a sort of sustained period of delivery and performance uh, and the game is really to keep that going for as long as possible. So when people say to me, for example, that um, you know, we need to do things quicker, I mean, it's actually the question I got asked most often when I first came into government was, well, you've got to make things happen quicker. I have never worked, I've never been anywhere where your ambition was to deliver projects faster. I've only ever been places where the height of ambition was actually to deliver them on schedule. And so for me, part of the thing we've been through over the last couple of years is, to, you know, back to the National in, uh, Infrastructure Plan has been to establish a programme which is realistic against which our performance can really be measured. And so I'm very, very focused on sort of making that shift so we can all say it's OK that this batch of things is getting delivered this year because that's what we said we'd do and look, it is. And this is what's going to happen next year and we're all happy with how this adds up to a set of outcomes over five and ten year periods. That's a, you know, clearly the right way to look at infrastructure. So we've got to get that right. As I've said, we've got to preserve the integrity of the, our um, independent regulation because that's key to getting so much of the stuff done. We've got to shepherd this energy transformation through its birth uh, and uh, deal with the teething problems that it'll no doubt have and really get outcomes there. And I think we're, we're on the way there. I think we've got to show great delivery on the big projects, you know, the totemic projects. So Neville's going to talk about uh, Thames Tideway Tunnel, that's up there. Anderson will talk about uh, HS2, that's up there. Um, clearly making sure that, you know, London Bridge uh, and Thames Link and Cross Link continue to demonstrate uh, terrific, uh, terrific delivery. Um, John will talk about the Highways Agency programme. It's a massive road building programme coming up, which, you know, which is great because you really see the benefits of that for both business and individuals coming through very quickly. So those are the kinds of things that I think the challenges we have over the next few years to maintain and accelerate the momentum. And I think the essence of uh, John and Nelson's comments were that we're beginning to get momentum. I think our job now is to increase it, uh, but then to be able to continue it at a rate which is, uh, which is sustainable. So that's, that's the plan. I know you're all going to play your uh, part in it. And uh, look, I'd be delighted to answer a, a couple of questions if we've, uh, if we've got time. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, that was, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. A lot of ground covered there, lots of interesting things that and I hadn't heard someone before. And, um, a question or two, Steve Fox. Could you give your name and your affiliation, Steve? There is a microphone somewhere. Gosh, uh, anyone hear it? Yep. Steve Fox, Dan Nuttall. Um, thanks for that call. Very interesting as ever. Uh, I think one of the dangers that we face is that in the national projects, everyone knows about the big things and they're on everybody's radar. But, but, what worries me, I think, is as this supposed field factor kicks in and we get more of this, particularly perhaps in construction, that creates more demand for local infrastructure. And I think people take an eye off the fact that the austerity programme is essentially more than halfway through. How are we going to find money for things that are essentially always have to be public funded by the taxpayer or by the user for local projects outside you know, local authority things that are needed to facilitate that growth? Are we going to stifle that growth? I think, look, you're absolutely right that you know, ultimately infrastructure is local, right? And um, it's local, it's, it's city leadership, it's uh, local, gov local authorities, um, and it's the LEPs from a strategic point of view who I think need to play a much, much bigger role in sort of building up from the ground and uh, putting in place some of the critical stuff we need. Now, one of the ways we're dealing with this, of course, is through um, you know, the local uh, you know, growth fund that, that we've got in place. I was actually with um, uh, Michael Heseltine and Greg Clark yesterday looking at the projects that each of the LEPs are putting forward in their plan to grab hold of the money that we have devolved 
down for capital projects into uh, into the local areas. I mean, the partic frankly, the particular area I was looking at was to try and link up the big strategies with the local plan. So I was trying to make sure that in each of the areas where HS2 is going to potentially make a transformational difference, that the local areas had put in plans to make sure we've got all the connectivity around HS2 to really make it work. And the good news was that people are actually thinking that way. You know, here's what we need locally to leverage off the big national investment that's going to happen. So uh, that's certainly one area where, uh, where we are trying to devolve more and more resources into the local area so we can support those projects. The comments you make about seven years planning, uh, possibly taking 30 years, you know, perhaps indicate that we are still locked in a, in a, in a, in a, in a situation where uh, it is very difficult to get through the planning process. David Higgins made a point about HS2 that it's in the lap of politicians to make sure that we hit uh, pro programme and cost on HS2. Uh, getting through that planning process is very, very difficult. I mean, what can you do to, to help big government uh, to, to make sure that we, ad we adopt the kind of the Olympian vision? Uh, to get behind these projects? Well, you know, I mean, there, there are a lot of... Frankly, everything I talked about was, was aimed at making all the processes more efficient so our delivery is, is just sharper. I, I don't... Uh, I mean, on, on the... Plat look, you know, we, ha we're, we live in a relatively s small country in terms of its land mass, which is relatively crowded compared to, um, you know, uh, some advanced economies. You know, we have you know, a cultural way of life and a parliamentary democracy. And, you know, I'm not, you know, we, 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 we always used to say when we were comparing ourselves to the Beijing Olympics, you know, you know we had CPOs, they had JCBs, and you know, they got things done faster. But I'm not sure we'd want to change that balance. So I'm, you know, some of that's just how we do business. Um, I, 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 the, the, the best answer I've got to getting things done is that we should actually just start earlier and be more consistent in our, uh, you know, in attacking these issues. Because most of the big projects that we're now talking about, it, it, it's, 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 you know, the, the delay has often been in the political decision to get started, not in going through the planning process. We know how long the planning process takes. Uh, you know, we're trying to streamline it, but it, you know, it's not a surprise. Therefore. You know, we need to have. You know, we need to build that into the process. So I, I know it sounds like a trite answer, but I quite like the response of just starting earlier, so we've got the outcome uh, when the economy actually needs it. Uh, last question. Um, I'm absolutely in agreement with everything you said, and it's really great to hear this sort of joined-up thinking about regulation and how funding appears and how we get schemes going, and. Um, Steve Fox's question was right on the money too about keeping the local infrastructure yeah. and encouraging local authorities, LEPs and so on. And you gave a good answer. All the bits are lining up. Finally, you know, we seem as an industry, as a country, to have got our what's it together. And now there's a general election coming. I know. And of course, we all know that's what happens. Vote conservative. Sorry. So, um... <laughs> Vote, vote for the party with a long-term economic plan. <laughs> so, it's that voting bit that's the tricky bit, isn't it? Yeah? Because you're never quite sure who's going to win the horse race. But it doesn't really matter because it's the hiatus that's created that's the problem. We all know that you know, nine months beforehand, for probably a year afterwards, everybody goes into brain freeze while they try to figure out what the new policy is. Yeah. And, and much though we might not want that to happen, unless something's different this time from every other time, we're going to lose momentum just at the point we'd started to pick up pace. And that's very damaging to the economy. What's going to be different this time around? Well, it's going to be worse because we've got, we've got, we've got a whole year to, you know, yeah, so I'm, as that, that was a flippant comment, but, you know, we do actually have to cope with a very different dynamic this year. We normally have six weeks to... Uh, focus entirely on the election. You know, we've got a, you know, we've got with a fixed-term parliament. It, 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 we're, it's like the uh, the United States, and you can take forever doing it. So that's a problem to manage it. I, again, I, I I have an answer which you know is so, is so simplistic that it can't possibly be right. But I, I, you know, my simple position on this is you don't actually if you've got the right policies in place and the right projects happening and the right processes continuing. 
I mean, 99.9% .9 of the people who are involved in this whole programme won't change at all. It's, a, it's just a tiny little bit at the top. Uh, whether it's quite the, whether it's really the top is a you know a, 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 the philosophical question, but the um, so I, I I don't you know the things that we're mostly engaged in here in the main you know don't require acts of parliament they just require you know decision making and terrific execution against a a long term plan so my you know uh, uh, and you know as you know John Armit is sort of the kind of, I mean, it's the advisor to the Labour Party, he and I don't really disagree on anything much. So, uh, you know, that's ultimately, of course, how we got HS2 agreed across the parties, because ultimately they know it's the, the right thing to do and they decided not to play politics with it. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, I think if you continue to do good work and you've got the right people in the, in the, in the key delivery jobs, there's really no reason to slow down. We'll have the odd issue, right, around, you know, Southeast England runway capacity. You know, the timing of the decision around that is, you know, it's not coincidental, it's uh, after the election. So there, there, there'll always be bits and pieces, but the vast majority of what we're doing should be part of a plan which you can put in this 10-year perspective where, uh, whose execution should not be unduly slowed by the political process. Points. I think there's more that's needed from the leadership yeah. in government and from the opposition too. If everyone was absolutely unequivocal that LEPs should continue to press forwards with scheme, that there's air cover for health or education or whatever, then those capital projects stand more chance of being continued with and not slowing down whilst really? everyone waits for budgetary uncertainty to be clarified. Well, you'll see in our autumn statement, you know, it's getting pretty close to the, you know, we'll be continuing to fill out the, uh, the capital programme for the next five years. So uh, it'll, it'll, get, it'll be tough to, uh, to change that course without really having a clear basis for justifying that change. So I think the clearer you are in your policy, in what's going on inside it, and the longer term you take, it always puts the onus on the politician to have to make the case that that isn't working, which is hard for them to do. There's so much that goes wrong in government that politicians tend to be fixing that. If you've got stuff that's going really well, uh, you know, it's, it's odd when you, you just leave it alone and take the credit for it. So, uh, I, I'm so you can see my school of thought, we'll, we'll, let's just get stuff going really well and no one, no, no one will play with it. I've got to go. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.